Okay, so just so everyone's aware, Chambers is unmuted and we are live now. Okay. All right, so I'll call the meeting to order. Stand for the pledge, please. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Got everyone here, but Brian, Mine, CXQ. We don't have any appointments, so many to approve in January. Not all at once, no. What's that now? I'll move it. Then it's second. <laughs> second, Basile. Sorry. Right. Any changes or anything? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, moving on to departments. Anything you want to tell us? Uh, no, just that the, the water authority is really moving forward quite quickly on the uh, Cuba Lake Protection Plan. And uh, just to re review it a little bit, the Cuga Lake Protection Plan is running a sewer line from Cuga, excuse me, from Aurora on the east side of Cuga Lake down to almost the Tompkins County line. So it includes Sunset Beach, Honical Road, uh, at Waters in that area. It's about 440 homes along the lake there that are presently on small lots. So this is a pretty good sized project. And I have some brochures here I'll put up on the table after meeting if anybody wants to get, get one, take some with them, they can. Uh, it's a big project. I think it's something that we should really endeavor to do. Uh, the area really could use public sewers. And I think it's a step in the right direction to protect the lake. Any questions? Anybody got anything for Carl in his report? I was Chris. just curious how that project's being funded. Uh, right now, we're, we're still going through Seeker. As soon as we get through Seeker, we'll be looking for grants. Okay. And any kind of low interest loans. Uh, we think the projects should rank high and be well funded. It'll be the village, excuse me, the town of Ledger, village of Aurora, and the town of uh, Genoa. So it's a multi municipality project. So it should fund very well. Thanks, Carl. That's good. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Kyle. Attach the correct report this month, and I have nothing to add to it. Anybody have any questions for Kyle on the attached right report this month? Nothing. All right. Thank you. Gary, buildings and grounds. If uh, you have my report, the only thing I was going to add. Uh, uh, on the roofing project, that's there's re resolution on PW4 uh, with your approval to fund that through the uh, building repair reserve fund. In order to do that, we need to have a public hearing uh, at the meeting of the 28th before you guys vote on that resolution uh, at the full legislature. Uh, the only other thing I'll add is the, uh, the surplus furniture is finally on the auction site and the auction will close on January. 20th, so we'll finally be able to get rid of some of that junk, or I mean, the, the furniture. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Matt, if you have any questions. <laughs> Anybody got any questions for Gary? Okay, if not, thank you, Gary. Thank you. So, Good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't have any changes or additions to my report. Nothing has transpired in the interim. Change any of the data that's there. Well, I guess the very question that I think those questions for Doug. All right, I'm just, you guys are great tonight. Okay. I, I saw on the um, Sterling Nature Center report something about the um, running out of us. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Uh, it's been a slow progression in the heron rookery that you're referring to. There were every year we tend to lose some of the trees that the wetland had, and so the rookery there gets smaller and smaller every year. It's kind of the natural eutrophication of the body of water that's there, so we're losing the trees that we were nesting in over time. It's been fewer and fewer, so 
is there any way to like restore some of that or build out some of that? That would be a question for Jim. I don't know if a replacement program has been successful anywhere. There would be infrastructure that would have to be placed, which would be prohibitive probably from a cost and permitting standpoint. That would be. I'd be happy to ask Jim that. I'd just be curious. That's a really special, yeah. special place. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Andy, could I ask a question? Yes. The CFA that wasn't for Emerson Park that was not funded. Yes. Is this if you don't succeed, try again? I mean, is, is that what happens or there's other funding opportunities that you're looking at or? So specifically for that project, um, out of the 1.75 million, that was the total project cost. The CFA grant was a half a million dollars. Uh, that's the gap that exists when we to move forward right now. That's the gap that the state was going to fill for us. Mm -hmm. So I have had some conversations with Steve in the planning office on whether we need to rescope the plan or just look for other funding to fill that gap as as it stands or as it's designed right now. And so we're having those conversations. <laughs> and the other funding then the gap funding was going to be raised is or budgeted for, I mean, for the total scope of the project? So it was a million dollars of uh, ARPA money originally set aside. So that was allocated to that program. There was about $250,000 allocated last year from, I believe it was an, it was an overage that was identified in that Medicaid fund. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the other half a million dollars to make up the 1.75 was the state grant, was the CFA. Okay. Grant. All right. And the time sensitivity is this ARPA money has to be committed and spent. Right. And that's so you're going to have to get this gap funding done by those deadlines. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Did you see the deadlines? What was the date? Uh, end of the. Uh, <clears throat> End of the ARPA window. Jim, is it 2024 allocated? It's got to be allocated, and then 2026 it has to be spent right. or returned. So 2024 it has to be allocated, but what's spent? Right. You see that a problem? No. No, not particularly. In other words, if you adjusted the scope of the project and did what we could, and it could be more of a short term. We, we looked at a little bit more comprehensive um, infrastructure plan to get the amphitheater section of the island built up, up to grade. So everything was there except the stage itself, which we think is responsible. We had some interest in that. But it's getting up to that that point. That was That's what we had designed that one point seven five million. So all the infrastructure, lighting, power, all the roadways, all the access to it. So we need to, need to really develop that venue. Very exciting. Yeah. So basically, we need to make sure all, not just we do anything, because our delegated is, um, we don't know what they're going to do. If you were to say, well, there was a delay because of this, that, or that, you know, we can't get it done until June of 27, are they going to say, oh, too bad, and take it back from right. us? I mean, which is what we're obviously concerned about. So, trying to avoid. So, we have to avoid, you know, getting too far out. Supply chain could be an issue. Make sure we get done what we can get done before we get too high, high in the sky stuff, I guess. I believe if, if it's after 2006, Andy, well, from what I'm being told, we do lose it. It does go back. Because that was part of the whole uh, agreement to begin with. That's a Lynn question. I don't know if Lynn's Lynn's gone. Okay, okay. I thought she was. She was in our office a little while ago. <laughs> make sure we nail everything yeah. down. The, Definitely. So if we're not in the third quarter of twenty-five, we're planning ourselves in trouble. So Andy, thank you, Trent. The, the the ARPA funding too, though. I think we're working on an alternative placing that we don't have allocated by twenty twenty-four. And it would have to be committed by the legislature on uh, and working with a budget officer to keep that money earmarked, so to speak, for those projects. There may there might be an alternative. But we I, to Andy's point though, we don't want to get there. We want to Get it, get it spent. We get it spent. We want to do the projects we know we can get done in the timeline. 
Anybody else for Doug? I skipped over Gary's resolution, so I'm going to skip yours for now, too, and just finish, and then we'll go back to resolutions. Yep. Oh, highway, Brian. <clears throat> I don't have anything to add to my report. Anybody got any questions? Anything for Brian? I just want to thank Brian and Shereen and, and your assistant for working on all the, all those bids. It was like 17 of them. Yeah, there's 26 in total. 26 in total. It yep. took a while, but you, all, you guys did a great job. Thank you. All right, so if nobody else has anything with Brian, we'll just start with his resolutions. Go ahead, Brian. To authorize the legislature to award the material bids for this. I have a motion. I'm moving. Second. Second, Brian. All right, any discussion? Not all in favor? Aye. Uh, Opposed? All right, PW7. PW7 is authorized to fill the garage manager position within the highway department. Um, that is the actually the same resolution we put in back in August, and it was passed, and um, we didn't get it filled in time. The budget, uh, during the budget process, it was removed from the, from the funding, so we need to put it back in. So we got somebody to run the water pool for the fleet management portion of it. I have a motion. Move it, Basile. I have a second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I have a question because it says to create and fill. So I just don't understand. Is this a brand new position? Is it funded in the 2023 budget? Because we're just in February and I feel like we've had quite a few positions come before us that seem new already. So I just want to understand how this came about, where it's coming from. Okay, so this is the same resolution that was in August of last year where we changed the, the title for the person that's going to run the motor pool to garage manager and funded it with the salary from the four persons position that was there at the time. And then when we got to the budget process, we were asked to present all of our unfilled funded positions. And that's when we lost in the budget process. How did it get lost in the budget process? I was asked to eliminate one of my funded unfilled positions during the budget to cut the budget. But if this passes and it wasn't funded, you will have two grad, you would have two staff in the motor More. pool instead of one. Correct. So that four person that we talked about before, you There's unfunded one. it and you already filled a garage person. If this passes, this will be an additional staff in cool. the motor pool that wasn't in the 2023 budget. Is that correct? Correct. So Brian. <clears throat> This motor pool is going to be uh, organized to take care of all of the county vehicles? Currently, yes. So if there's departments that presently, it, it's kind of a uh, free-for-all with how we take care of vehicles. And it's kind of like what we did with, with Tom and all the computers going under one department. Is we're going to manage our, our motor pool like a motor pool instead of managing it. Uh, and I would hope that next year we would see some cost savings or be able to reduce some, some of the time lost by employees trying to figure out how to get their vehicles fixed or where they're going to go. I understand the need for, I understand what the position needs to do and what we're looking to have done. I'm just concerned that there's like I said in February and it's not just it's not just this department we've seen multiple things come forward with jobs that we're being asked to fill or that wasn't in the budget and it seems very early in the year that we're we're doing this when the budget just passed last month that's my concern um we had a chance to talk earlier yep. I appreciate your insight on this my concern is that we did approve this last year and as part of a bigger plan for reorganizing your department somehow didn't get put in the budget i don't i i didn't 
I didn't catch that or wasn't fully aware of that. And so now we do have this situation where it's not budgeted and here we are. And I will definitely support it because I think it makes sense for your department and where you're going and what you talked about in terms of managing fleets. And um, I was wondering if you could just give a little bit of history on, on the motor pool in general in terms of you know how that how that's been positioned within so this the department. This actually was brought up a year and some months ago. We started talking about the motor pool because we were not recovering 100% of the highway funds that were being expended in other departments. And so we looked at it and last midsummer, they decided that you know, there wasn't an option to privatize the motor pool, it just wouldn't work out. So then we went in the direction of trying to reorganize it. And that's where the garage manager come in. Um, we, at highway, we can only spend highway funds on highway. So the, when we work, I'm gonna pick on Brian a little bit. When we work on the sheriff's department, cars, we have to build them out for the time that we are working on their vehicles and whatever parts are, are worked on their vehicles. Um, and we're not recovering 100% of that, the way motor pool was being run before. Um, we are, we did make some good strides just in the first month of this year. Um, we're up to about 68%. But we're not at that 80%, 90% where we need to be um, to justify, you know, and, and the way we're going to do that is with a fleet manager. We need, we need a person that that's what they're doing. They're running the minute to minute of this and tracking the time. Uh, Motor pool currently sets over at the city garage, which is on the other side of the city from where I'm at. And, and I cannot physically do the job and do the highway job at the same time. Dave. Yeah, and, and can you explain, Brian, that the, the superintendent or whatever you want to call that person, uh, the motor pool person in charge, is physically going to be working on the cars too? Yes, yes. That this garage manager also in their job description has the the ability to actually work on the vehicles as needed as support. If the mechanic has to take a day off, the garage manager will still be there to keep things flowing, and they're also going to track the time and make sure we're building out one hundred percent. Where now it's 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 a little bit sketchy, but with them they're pretty much on their own over there. Well, here's here's one thing I think everybody needs to realize. I mean, in Brian's job description, and any highway superintendent, this county's heads job description, it's never said, "Oh, you're in charge of." Not picking on you again, Brian, but the sheriff's cars, the health department's cars, all that. I mean, there, there's nothing that says. Highway superintendent is also in charge of motor pool. Okay, so we discussed, do we need a motor pool department? Well, we're trying to save the taxpayers money by not coming up with all these different departments. So I guess my question to you to explain to everybody is doing it this way, is this, in your opinion, the most efficient way? It's not going to hurt the highway department by taking people from you when you need them but it's also not gonna cost us a crap ton of money by creating a whole new department and, and whatnot. If we and we do it in this direction. If we could put a garage manager in, once the motor pool is moved back to 91 York Street, it'll, it'll be twice as efficient just because we'll be able to share those mechanics. We'll be able to work with the highway mechanics instead of hiring more highway mechanics, which I'm short one right now, you know, I haven't put in for yet. Um, we'll be able to share that motor pool mechanic and the highway mechanic with that garage man under that garage manager, they'll be able to be more efficient in the same building. Because let's face it, they're not the motor pool part, we'll call it wherever, you know, whatever bay you put them in or whatever, is not going to have a car in it all the time. Every day, every hour of the day. That well, right now we're playing catch up and we're we're it's pretty busy. We're booking out two to three vehicles a day. But I do see in the future the calendar is not filling as fast because we got, you know, we're catching up from when George was sick in December and November. And so we are catching up. So there will be some downtime that those mechanics, if they are still paid under the highway fund, will be able to work on highway equipment. And then we'll recoup that extra percentage and we'll get us at hundred percent. And that's part of it. That's important because before. Because right now they set, they set over on the other side of the city. And when they're, when they're, when they have no vehicles to work on, they're just sitting there. Yeah. because there's no vehicles to work on. And putting this on highway before, 
when it's technically not, you know, in your job description, we weren't getting reimbursed. Correct. The way we should. So we were wasting taxpayers' money. Correct. So, and this this all came up yeah, up again. We had a meeting in the chairman's office because I <coughs> put some of the workload back onto the department heads that I couldn't handle. And the department heads come back and said, you know, hey, we don't have the staff to handle this either. You know, so that's where this why this has all been brought back up again. Which also just to mention, I mean, that means, you know, what you're basically talking about is if a department head got a notification that one of their vehicles had a recall. Yes, that, it, that was the hot topic. And they didn't want to run it to one of the local dealers here to have something done with it. That's where you have to do it. And without getting 100% reimbursed for this kind of stuff, when it, depending on what department it was, they would be getting reimbursed for that kind of stuff. I mean, I got to think of down the line of who we're trying to save a buck for here and get our stuff done efficiently. And in terms of looking at fleet management across the county, countywide fleet management, is this, I know you mentioned potentially software or having yes. a person be more involved in that um, where maybe we don't need. Yeah, we're currently looking for highway for our, our, our asset management program is, is no longer going to be supported. The company is, has been sold and they're, they're, they're doing away with the program. So we have to purchase a new one for, for highway. And we would, you know, we've been looking with the intent that motor pool stuff could be kept in that same, in that same program and share that program with, with motor pool. Which we're looking for a multi-base system rather than just the highway related stuff. <laughs> Which will record all of our vehicles. Correct. And we probably will be amazed to see that some of them get very, very little miles put on. There are some that there was one just recently that the brakes were set up because it sat so long over at the motor pool hadn't been used. Which there's a waste of the taxpayers' money. Right. We need to figure a lot out in our our fleet. Well, one person overseeing the fleet, it'll be a lot more. The ability to, if uh, I don't know, and some department doesn't have a vehicle, you know, once in a while they need vehicles, you know, with one person scheduling that, if if Bob Shea need a vehicle to go to training, the, the the fleet manager could say, yeah, Bob, car, you know, the health department car 22 is not being used this week. You'll take that one for two days. You know, I mean, that, that's the type of stuff that you can see happen. Or now Bob would have to go to each individual department. And, and try to find somebody that's willing to share a car with. So that's another benefit of having a fleet management. All right, anybody else on this one? Fun to help. Oh, you're set. All right, if not, all in favor, P the PW7? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, PW8. He is to fill the general foreman's position due to retirement. Second, Basile. Questions? This has been empty, what, two, three months now? Two months. Yes, his, his vacation time is just about up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Retirement, two, three months early. That's a vacation time. time. But that's a whole other story. All right, all in favor, of PWA? All right. Any opposed? All right, anything else, Brad? All right, Gary, we'll go back to you. Yeah, PW1 is uh, drafted. Uh, I don't think we're planning on doing anything action on that uh, today. It was put in as a placeholder. It's for to move forward with the uh, uh, awarding uh, an agreement with the uh, uh, architect to do the next step in the Hugh County office building feasibility study. So uh, anyway, I don't think we got a rule on that today, but it'll be brought up uh, at, the, at the legislative meeting and you guys can fill in the blanks. PW2 authorizes the chair of the Hugh County legislature to sign a one-year renewal agreement with Bergman Architects, Engineers and Planners to create plans, designs, and specifications for a variety of county projects. I have a motion. I'm going to have a second. 
Um, second. Christina, all right. Any questions on PW2? Is this existing stuff, Gary, that we're, yes. we're working on? Now? Yeah, it's ongoing projects that we're working on. For example, they're the ones that actually designed the, uh, the roof projects. So I could go out to bed uh, and make it fair for all the bettors. So basically, we're not going to change horses in the middle of the race. Right. It's kind of stupid. All right. No other questions. W two, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. PW three. If PW three authorizes the superintendent of buildings and grounds to request proposals to remove the old bank drive through from the Hardenburg building, located at Eight Dill Street, rather than installing a new roof on that section of the building. At a cost of $122,000. I have a motion. Move it to seal. Second. 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 Uh, so any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, PW4. Okay, PW4 authorizes the chair of the Cuba County Legislature to sign an agreement with WCA Roofing and Sheet Metal Company Incorporated to re roof two sections of the Hardenburg roof. Uh, including some masonry repairs and replacement of a safety ladder to, to the upper roof. Authorize the transfer of money from capital uh, reserve account and establishing a capital H project number 2301 for that work. I have a motion. Move it. Move it a second. I'll second. Second, Christina. Any questions? Hearing on that. If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any PW5? A PW5 is authorized the chair of the Cuba County Legislature to sign an agreement with WCA Roofing and Sheet Metal to remove the section of the Public Safety Building roof, the section over the 911 Center. Move it. Move it. Second. Uh, second. Do you have any questions or not on this for Gary? No. All right. All in favor, PW5? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. All right, Doug, the parks resolutions. Yep. Uh, starting with PW9, uh, this is an authorization to fill the position of the building maintenance mechanic uh, due to a vacancy. We had a promotion of the mechanic position vacant in our department right now, uh, and it is budgeted for this year. No motion. Move it. Second, Basile. Basile, any questions? So this is just the same number of people in the department. Yep. All right, all in favor, PW9. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, PW10. Well, PW10 is authorization to fill a part-time typist position. Uh, this exists uh, within the department. It's been vacant for several years, uh, in fact. Uh, so it's a position that we would like to fill to offer support a lot to a lot of our inbound and our reservation system and uh, some of the AP and AR functions that are currently being handled by the office through the director's office. All right, I have a motion. Move it, Basile. I have a second. Second. Okay. All right, any questions? Christina. I have a question. So if this was unfilled for several years, is it was still budgeted, it was still funded in, in, in your budget? It was we budgeted for it this year. This year it's not been budgeted though okay. in the couple of previous years. Okay. And it was brought over when the department was created in 21. Um, I used to share a position actually with Gary. We had a, a type of position that we shared when the departments were combined. So sorry. All right, so, <laughs> thank you. So yeah. I'm gonna be the I'm going to ask the question that if it's been empty for years, why now? As we have grown, and I've found that it's difficult for us to do the development work that we need to do on some of these projects as we get into some of the larger projects, and, and at the same time, make sure we're still servicing the customer and the taxpayer and answering the phones. Um, it's been it's been a challenge, and I see, I can see now why, as I look backward, why there was a type of position there used to be called assistant park maintenance supervisor and a park maintenance supervisor. Those are the three positions that were traditionally there. There was actually an event coordinator before that too, but um, the type of position would really be the person that's there answering the phone and really routing a lot of the work that's there. In addition, we do a lot of our own purchasing. And we do a lot of our own accounts payable, <laughs> the shelter reservations, deposits, and returning those, and all the contract management that we have. Here. They're repetitive tasks, but they're time consuming, and we also obviously need some accuracy on those. 
So if you spend a lot of time doing those, that's great. And it's great on, as a, from our front end users, but it, it becomes more challenging to do further development, further event development, recruiting of events and the contract management of the larger contracts that we have with our vendors. So who's answering the phones now? So we are, um, generally speaking, uh, you know, phone calls from the public take 20 to 25 minutes uh, per phone call, and that's if they don't require any follow-up. Um, so if you have several of those during the day, and we have a lot of days when accounts payable, our batches are due, and a lot of those, so if I have the same person do both of those, it becomes, it becomes quite challenging to be timely for our internal partners and responsive for our external. I just have an example of uh, within the last couple of weeks, I needed to call, um, get some information for a constituent, and it was your deputy director who took took the call. Okay. All right. Anybody else? All right. If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, I'm opposed. CW11. Are you opposed? I'm opposed. I didn't whisper. I didn't whisper anything. I hear even your whispers. I don't know. PW11. PW11 is support of the snowmobile trail development and maintenance fund. Uh, this is draft legislation that is part of this year's New York State budget. Uh, this was brought to our attention by uh, our Q County Snowmobile Association. Uh, they would like to see the fees that are the registration fees for uh, snowmobile registration increased. Uh, they spend approximately through the fund uh, right now, the all the clubs across the state, state spend about $7 million on their trail maintenance. They're receiving back from the state about $4.2 million. Uh, it hasn't been changed since the mid 90s. So they are advocating, our Q County Snowmobile Association is advocating an increase of the fees. Um, Trish, you had a question earlier today, and I, did, I was able to dig into it a little bit. The current fees as they stand, um, if you're a club member in New York State, it's $45 to register your snowmobile. If you're um, a non-club member, it's $100. Their proposed fee rate change would be, uh, if you are a club member, it's $65. And if you're a non-club member, it's $135. And again, from the language that was written and the accompanying letter that was sent, they're trying to make up the gap the clubs are expecting to do so. So can I have a motion for PW11? I'll move it. I have a second. I'll second. Second from Trish. All right, discussion. I'm going to start because did you talk to anybody other than Chris Lukens? Each uh, word. I don't know. I know Chris Lukens. Well, he's the one that made it in the paper because here's the whole problem with all this. So I'd like to enlighten some people because my brother is on the board of the Cato Trailblazers, they get paid X amount of dollars per mile they groom. The clubs have got this much dollars this year from the state. So when the state says that they're going, oh, this is all going to the clubs, I mean, there's no way we can prove it, but you think they're going to keep it in there and it's not going to go into the coffers when they're paying you even the Tug Hill snowmobile clubs are suffering this year because they haven't had near the snow that they normally do. But that's how they get paid. Trust me, they're they're wishing for a six inch snow just so they can go out once and groom what you really can't even ride on, just so they can collect something. So you won't see new signs next year for signs that get broken from the idiots that'll, that are out now on four wheelers when they shouldn't be. You won't see none of that kind of stuff because they're not getting any money from the state. From this registration fee and i don't know if sue's still here i don't see her but i'm quite sure she could tell you that in the past two years that we've had a weak winner because i got buddies that don't do it we register ours every year we roll the dice we went up north once so far this year but i got tons of buddies that have never registered their sleds this year so they won't if you look at the next 30-day forecast because we ain't going to get any snow to ride on from the looks of things they won't next year especially now that the fee has gone up. So they can hide this, that it's, oh, it's going to the snowmobile clubs, but talk to the people in the snowmobile clubs who actually know they're getting paid X amount of dollars per mile that they grew. That's how that system works. So that's how much they got this year so far. And that's how much they're going to get because it don't look like we're going to get any snow. 
just telling you what really happens. Nobody can say what they want. What's the conclusion? They're just raising another fee. It costs more to register a snowmobile than it does for you to register your car for two years. I mean, and they want to force you to join a club, which I'm good with. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we get a free club membership because the Bain County Trail goes through our farm. So that's what they do. But the clubs, like every year, would give all the landowners a $20 pizza coupon. I'm going to tell them, keep your 20 bucks. Don't waste it on us this year if you're going to, because you didn't make nothing. But they still, I mean, they haven't spent a ton neither because they haven't groomed once. But they still all went out and put up every one of those signs that they got to go take down. I mean, I'd almost, if I was in a club, just wait till the first damn snowfall to put up signs now because you never know if you're going to get any. You know? I mean, it's crazy, but Chris? I appreciate your insight, Andy. Um, and I'm just curious, has there been any look at um, advocacy for those registration fees to go to the clubs uh, regardless of the weather? Well, they because they're they, still grooming and, and trail maintenance the, going on. And, well, there's no grooming. Uh, other than up in the Tug Hill a little bit, but, but, and they don't really have enough snow now to ride. I mean, most groomers across this state have sat all winter. I mean, well, like you said, with the signage and things like that, like yeah. somebody's still going out and checking those. Well, that's all volunteer stuff because the people don't love to ride snowmobiles. Otherwise, where it just goes back into the state coffers. Well, it's supposed to, the way I read it, I don't know about you, Doug, is it's supposed to go into a trail maintenance fun right. but if they're not using it we all know how government works because we do it here move this from there to there because well we're not using this so let's put it here oh look this fund's got millions of dollars that never got used last year so let's put it over here because we really need it now and then next year we could get pounded who knows with snow sure but well, we we do budget on the revenue for it and we've already vouchered for the 70 percent of the checks are the checks are due to us any day actually yeah. so we we will get that 70% of that money now, and we'll get 30% in May or June, we can voucher for it. So we, we will receive those funds in. Um, there are a lot of other eligible expenses for trail maintenance outside of the group and voucher for, but a lot of years when it's busy and they are doing a lot of grooming, they can be, the grooming will suck up almost all that money, basically, just because of the, the total cost of the time and what they get for mileage. Um, outside of that, though, in years where they've had to do other projects, anything from stone to culvert replacements, all those actually can be done with TMD money also. So there is a little bit of flexibility there, but this isn't this year's an aberration. We haven't been out. We haven't been out. Well, it's, it's it's our, our club's not one, right. one now, not once. Not once. Not once. Not once. Not once. Not once. It doesn't look good. Can I ask a question? So the registration fees that are collected go into a trail maintenance fund, yep. and that money then gets redistributed back either to the to a variety of different activities including the snowmobile clubs but potentially to, to parks and trails for the work that you do as well we do not we do not vouch for it okay we don't do any voucher for it. brian and i have actually had conversations about this uh, about you know whether or not we would be eligible for larger whole section trail rehabs, things like that, larger projects. Um, but as it stands right now, the money in that TME funds flows straight. It flows through the county, like the county actually receives it, but we're, we get a voucher from all of the clubs. We process that, and then the money flows through the county and right back based on what they voucher request for. Because what happens if there's not expenditures to vouch for them? Does that money just sit and build up in the Fund they can the state, they or? could make adjustments in the 30 percent, but honestly it just not, and not in the years that i've been here we've never had this little activity of grooming and things like that as andy said that's where a lot of the expenditure goes is through the grooming so we're a little bit in uncharted territory because of, because of the winter we're having that's why the tug hill is trying to groom as much as they can. right because you're talking an area that normally gets well over 200 inches of snow and they haven't. So they've actually, to a detriment a little bit, groomed a little too much, which for anyone doesn't know, the more you groom, the more your trail shrinks, basically. So they've lost their trails now because of this. So they don't have rideable snow. But yeah, you could still, in a lot of places up there, walk off in the woods and it might be up to your knee. But, you know, 
Oh, did you ever arm it? Then? Well, yeah, I did. Thank you, Chair. Um, my understanding was that it does stay in a fund. I talked to some of the snowmobile uh, people up in District One for the Sterling Trail Blazers. Tamer. 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 Tamers. Tamers. Okay. And that uh, again, they correct on when they groom, they get the bill and so forth. Um, and and I'm just kind of curious then, from your perspective, Andy, as to they didn't really seem overly objective to this because there was um, they thought that would increase the fees that they're getting because the cost of maintaining equipment, the cost of fuel, and things. Although they haven't done anything this year, they've always run a deficit and they had to do fundraisers and and things to cover what's not covered by what they get from the state. Well, there's the potential of that there, yes. If it, I mean, if it stays where it's supposed to stay, but we all know what state we live in. Does anything stay where it's supposed to stay when they piss something away here and then need money? Well, let's steal it from here. They don't need it, they got no snow. So then next year, if we get a lot of, I'm not saying it's not a horrible thing, but it's also, you're they're kind of screwing themselves a little too because when you raise a fee so much and people know i mean we're talking about something you use three months out of the year and if you know we're getting these kind of winners and all of a sudden 50 percent of people who used to register stop registering you know, it's not like a motorcycle or a boat you're going to use that you you know i bet my farm that you can use your motorcycle and your boat sometime between April and November, but there's no guarantee that between November and the end of March that you're going to use your snowmobile the way the last couple of years are. So there's people now who don't want to pay the money that they're charging. So now when you increase like this, was the trail snowmobile clubs really hurting that bad to start with? We weren't. We came over, you guys. I mean... They're mostly hurting for volunteers. Well, it's just like fire department. But that's my point. So now this is good for them. I'm not saying vote no against this. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to vote yes. I'm just trying to point out that it's not always what they tell you in Albany. You know, look at us, rah, rah. We're going to give the snowmobile clubs more money. But, yeah, may not when people stop registering their snowmobiles. Ready? Doug, what is the historical... Um, uh, information around the state reimbursing. You know, we're hearing about the state moving its money around and you never know, but what is the historical um, reality of the reimbursement? From I mean, the up until this fees? year, we have received everything that has been vouchered for and the voucher requires the receipts and everything to be submitted to them. And that's how it, it's a pretty extensive, obviously just, tracking right of all the expenses that are put into it and then the vouchers that come back come from that fund. Doug, I, I belong to the club and I, I do the grooming also, but so I know we get paid for trail maintenance, but when we don't submit a voucher for the, the mileage for the trail grooming, what happens to that money that's that we got that 70%, but you're not going to even come close to, to getting that. Uh, expenditure for that 70 percent because there's nobody out yeah. on the trails now, what happens to that money i think that's really the question that yeah. i can say we've never we've never experienced that we have, we have so do we know that that was going to be able to be kept in that an account or are they going to come back and say well you didn't use it now we're going to take it they haven't released any guidance about it for this year i'm expecting some shortly because of where we are in the season and how it's been for most of the state it seems like which there's a scary part. You come up with a law or a bill or something, but you don't release any information as to how it's going to work. That ought to kind of come along with it. And, it. and it may be stipulated in there. Like I said, we just haven't run across it before. So I can look at the, the grant, the contract. I mean, I hope it works out well, but yeah. I, I'd also like to see Sue or any action work we'll come up with something and show us where snowmobile registrations are this year compared to the last, you know, like three or four. I'll bet you you'll see this dramatically. If the increase and if the cost is going to increase, you're going to see it because you're supposed to, I mean, they sent them out in what, August? I didn't register mine. Yeah, there you go. 
can I ask you a question? So um, just one last question. Uh, so everything in the past that we vouched for essentially was really urged that a certain percentage to um, go with. Um, everything that's collected, I mean, statewide, is, is that fund fully go back to the um, local clubs or like, is the state fully, spent, fully allocating those fees back or are they taking a portion uh, I mean, that's for the design of the fund, but I would have to, I would have to dig into like last year's numbers to see the disbursements. I mean, I think that's just up there. Curious, yes, uh, that because they are collecting those fees. Uh, yep. What's the fund balance at the end of the year versus the beginning? Of the yeah, year? Sure. yeah. And, and so my last question, can and and Trish just kind of can we can we maybe table this and have someone speak to us at the full ledge meeting about that? Is there somebody from the snowmobile organization for Cuyahoga County that we could invite to? Go over that, and, and is the money kept someplace? Yeah, but they're not going to know where the money's kept. I mean, just like Can we ask, just like Doug just said, state controller. Yeah, state controller. Oh, let me I'm not know. saying this is a bad thing. I mean, I'm going to support it. I'm just saying I think they're, you know, shooting themselves in the foot with increasing the cost the way it is. I mean, like I know at least 10, 12 people that you just said the same thing. Forty-five bucks a piece. I mean, ninety bucks. So, spread that across all of upstate New York that has gotten squat for. I mean, I got buddies in Buffalo. Yeah, they got the blizzard, but it was gone in a week. They couldn't ride snowmobile. There was too much, and then it went to 50, 60 degrees, and it just all became, you know, bush. And they've had nothing since. So it's it's a. And I think increasing the cost of something like that is going to create more marks. <laughs> We're going to say, well, I'm going to wait and see if we actually, and you can't blame it. You know, so, I can, I know several. Oh, I know, like I said, 10, 15, I just off the top of my head. I, I know there's a lot more. Um, all right, so PW11. Anybody else want to heat it up? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. Hans and Trish. PW12. PW12 was authorizing an increase in the salary of the deputy director for the Parks and Trails Department. Motion. Not all at once. Moving for discussion. Zeal, second. Okay, I'll second. Discussion. Jim, you want to explain a little bit of this to the uh, to the group? Sure. Um, the salary was set for this position when the department when the department was created at the end of twenty one. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we actually changed a couple of positions from part time to full time created a compression where I've got uh, uh, staff that report through a deputy director to me that uh, actually have a higher compensation rate than this. So we budgeted this year to increase the salary. So it will be above the associated supervisors that we below this position to reverse that. <laughs> Max, it wasn't even compression, it was inversion where we had a deputy director that was actually had a lower salary than some of the folks that reported to that position. Was this budgeted? Yes. Else. So is this because that person got moved up? Because, I mean, how did they? They were taken as separate when it was when the department was created. There was a, the increase was not associated with the bringing it over to the department at that time. So they were two separate things. It was the creation of the department, and the salary was brought over at the salary that was at the time it went from the assistant part made to supervisor to the deputy director job. Separate from that, there were some other salary changes that were made in the department that created the version. So this has been, I'm assuming, run through HR and they're good with it and all that. Yeah. So that so that person now is not making less than the people that work for them. Correct. They'll be the supervisor making 
supervising those people and, and doing whatever else they do. Correct. And they came over willingly knowing that this was it and budget time came around and this is really to set that salary upright. So it was underwater. Anybody else? Not all in favor, PW12? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, PW13. So PW13 is authorizing an increase in the part-time salary budget for the Agricultural Museum. This is two thirds at the full edge, right? Not ways. Full edge, yeah. Can I have a motion? I'm a bit. Can I have a second? Second. Second hand. Or you just want to say what it is? Sure. Everybody knows. So this is so all of our staff at the Agricultural Museum are part time. We track them in two different ways. Uh, when I when I submit the budget, we have basically a line for all of our museum aides. That's the one position that is all of the museum aides. Anybody that helps them. Yeah. The other position is our museum director. In the budget this year, when we, when we submit the spreadsheet that has all those, we separate those. Unfortunately, they're actually the same line within the budget. So when I submitted the budget, I submitted all the money for the aides, and I did not submit the money in there, in combine those two in the budget for the actual museum director position. So that's the difference. That's where it came from. It was an omission in the data entry of it. So instead of the number that we saw, it was $30,000 less than before. The reason that doesn't show up in aggregate is because we added several projects to the museum budget this year, which make that wash. If you look at historically the last five years of the agricultural museum budget, you see pretty steady changes, increases from year to year. There really wasn't anything when you look at the budget in the aggregate to pick that up. So I think it would be easy to miss if we, we added almost $40,000 in projects between roofing, networking, and some stuff that needs to be in the budget for this year. It almost washed out in aggregate, the number not being in there. So it really wasn't until we started to do payroll, we looked at that line and knew it wasn't going to cover. So then when I went back and looked, our part-time budget line in there is exactly what we pay the museum age for the year, which means it was only that line, subline of our salaries that was included. So is this budgeted for or no? It is not. This is not. Any other questions? You look like you have a question, Neely. I, I was trying to follow that. <laughs> so it, it really was your error. It was the yeah. your error going into the tentative budget. Yep. By mistake, you left out thirty thousand dollars worth of expenses. Yep. So in order to make you whole, thirty's got to come from somewhere. Correct. And in here, it's coming from the the general fund. That uh, this think, resolution passes. I'm oh, sorry. contingency. Contingency is when I talked to um, Lynn, okay. she suggested that's where it would come from. So it, it was an error that it was left out. Correct. Your error, and now to make your budget whole, you got to find thirty thousand dollars from somewhere, and she's yep. recommending contingency. Correct. And that's why it's two thirds. I did ask Tim; he's would like to get paid this year. So what? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get it for you. I didn't make him any promises. <clears throat> so basically, next year you will make sure that thirty thousand. Yes. Or whatever is in the <laughs> and obviously, if Lynn says contingency, that's. I have my opinions on that too, but anybody else on that? Um, if I could just make a recommendation or an ask that, and she's obviously looked at that contingency line because she's recommending this, but I feel like we've got a lot of things coming out of contingency versus the staff related things um, that passed up for various reasons. And that would be great if she could give an update, maybe. Uh, or something so that we know where we stand with, with our contingency. Um, but yeah, I definitely support, you know, paying those part-timers. So well that's why something this size I've had this discussion for years. I mean I just think take it out of the general fund. We've had those arguments. Why why are we not taking a general fund? Is there a reason why? I, I'm just unfamiliar why we're doing that. You have to speak to the budget director. Yes. I, I kind of I usually when we go to fund stuff, I ask her where she thinks it's gonna come from, and that's where that's what I would But you don't suggest that you just kind of meet where she says where it's coming from. Yeah. 
Do we, we have any idea where we are with it? We had 200,000 in contingency when we passed the budget. So I don't know what the balance is. It seemed like we've been dipping, dipping, yeah, dipping. We might be, you know, I'm, I'm sure she wouldn't put us in the deficit. No, I can't. But um, I like to know where we are. <laughs> oh, yeah. Quarterly, like, quarterly reports on everything. Oh, yeah. And when the contingency runs low, we <laughs> do a resolution to take it out of the general, general fund, fund to re. Supply. supply contingency, so it's like whatever. I mean, it's not a, it can't, yeah. be a, it can't be a lot. Of that. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm in agreement with Brian and Trish. Can we get a since it takes two thirds of a vote? Can we get a report before the full red meeting? Yes. Can we request one? Yeah, I a, can inquire with Len. <laughs> yeah, I, we can have Len give a report for sure. Yeah. But that's what the word contingency is for. Yeah, we're, right. But we're, we're, you know, if we started with 200 to Andy's example, where are we at right now? We're in month two. And how long before we move money out of the general fund? <laughs> contingency? We probably don't know that. I'll ask Lynn to do a report. I'll have her send it out prior to the meeting. Everybody okay with that, Chairman? All right, so all in favor of PW 13? Aye. Anybody opposed? All right, so we have county attorney here, PW 14. You want to read it or you want me to read it? Brett, want to read it or? I can read it. It's in front of me. So it's for authorizing the chair of the Q County Legislature to execute a fourth addendum to a lease agreement with the city of Auburn. Um, there has been an agreement in the past and currently, and we're just looking to extend that. Can I have a motion? Move it, Maldra. Move it, Brian. Go second. Second, Marco. Second, Christina. Anybody got any questions for Brett on this, Jim? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't, I thought I had a copy. Is this is just a general lease agreement or is this the first post, post, post office? That's what I was like. General lease that where they pay for oh, the post office building. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's something we've been doing. Yeah. Yes. It came in. Since 1997. Yeah, it's nothing new. I'm done with your um, I was just wondering about the, the one year term. You could comment on that. Is that pretty standard for this lease? Because I know they're looking at doing some major investments in uh, uh, space. I might have to defer to Chris on this. The but. city is looking to make significant changes, having changes made, I should say. And, uh, Okay, so that's in recognition of more to come right. with those changes. Yep. Like what standard usually? How many years? I want to say five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is a one year extension. They had some personnel changes over there, and you know, they take a little bit longer than probably they anticipate. Okay. Oh, that's the change one year extension. Uh, I don't know if they asked or if we suggested. I don't. I'm but they're, sure. they're aware of it. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Anybody else for PW14? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion to adjourn. Last one. Move it. Second for seal. All in favor? Aye. Uh, judicial public safety about five minutes
Just enjoy it. Uh, I, it's like herding cats. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, judicial public safety. If I can get everybody to stand for the pledge of flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, roll call. I think everybody is here. Uh, Amy McNabb Coleman has been excused. So, with that, I believe we have a full quorum. Uh, minutes to approve. Second. Motion and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Carried. Uh, I have no appointments tonight, so we will get right into it. Uh, 911, Denise Spingler, please. Good evening. Uh, you have my report. There's a couple of highlights on it. We do have the one vacancy. Um, <clears throat> I've requested HR to canvas for that position. Um, as a reminder, there, I think there were only three people left on the current list, but there's a test coming up this weekend. So um, we, we'll get the results from that. But there's also some um, potential for state civil service to kind of change what they're going to do over the course of the next 12 months that we may not have to um, use a list, but that's kind of forthcoming. And if we get to that point, it'll be great. So it'll be so much easier to fill positions. I think that's only going to be for a 12 month period. Um, and we'll have to, um, I talked to Diane and HR will have to put some resolutions to, for the county to approve um, making them not competitive without using the list. And it would have to go on to the state for approval. But we do meet the criteria. Dispatch was one of the positions that they have seen across the state that are um, <clears throat> grossly under, dispatch centers are grossly understaffed. And it's a statewide problem. It's not, you know, it's not a community county issue. So thankfully we are not. Um, we, we do just have the one position. Um, we did a spillman patch uh, first week of February and it's really just a software update to the, to the um, system to bring it up to a new version. Uh, everything went well with that. And then in regards to the communication system, um, the Red Creek project is done at the Sterling site. So they are um, aligned with that. And one of the things Motorola has done over the course of the last few weeks is gone to sites and looked at um, old equipment that's no longer being used for the system. And we've cleaned all that up to get that out of the sites. And I have two resolutions. Go ahead. I have JP2. JP1 and 2. JP1 is authorizing the chairman of the legislature to sign it. Penn Tower. Yep, Penn Tower. That's, um, that's a standard one that we do every couple of years. This is a three year quote that will not increase over the course of the three years. Move it. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. JP2. JP2. This is a request to extend the MOU that we um, have in place for the weekend incentive. That, I have to say, has gone over very, very well. Like, I have to say, better than I expected. Um, the, the end date on that was set because we expected at that point our trainees would be on the floor and in a schedule. However, we've kind of changed how we're training and we're training them on all three disciplines before we're putting them in a schedule. Um, and that's working out very, very well. So we anticipate them being in a schedule probably mid-August. All three will be cleared at that point on all three disciplines, which is something we've never done before. So I'm asking to if we can extend the weekend incentive just through August. As a reminder, this is just Friday, 3 p.m. through Monday morning. And it's helped with staffing immensely. It's helped with people getting time off on weekends because people are picking them up. Uh, we're not seeing the mandated overtime on weekends that we were seeing. And I have to say it's been a morale booster. Mike, y'all move it. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Uh, any discussion? So just, I mean, how does this, how does this affect your overtime budget, I guess, compared to like mandatory when it used to be mandatory? So it's a, it's a little bit more because they get that extra half time. 
slide, it hasn't really impacted our budget. We were still well under budget last year. Um, and this year we, we have a vacancy that we've had all year. So we're not gonna see an adverse impact to our budget. And because it's only that short time period of the weekend, it doesn't, it's, it's, not, it's not costing us a lot. So the vacancy you have is in your salary line. Do you have to move it to your overtime line if you ended up? No, or it, it, Lynn, it Lynn washes it all out it's, because we, okay. have, we always, it, it's a historic thing. It's kind of interchangeable. Always, She's yeah, ready. we've always had salaries. We've always come in under budget and salaries and we're always over budget and overtime, but they kind of wash. And, and this is the enhanced additional time yep. if you volunteer. If you volunteer, yep. <laughs> Any other questions? So you won't really need this as much once these open people get the line. No, and we'll, well, I'd like to say that we're not going to have the, the the open shifts that we have today because they're all going to be filled. Um, you know, we're always going to have people calling in sick and we're always going to have people take vacations, you know, so we're always going to have overtime, but the once they're in a schedule, it should really cut down on it is the hope. But I, I always think, hope that and then something happens. Do you so. think they'll ask to continue this? No, 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 I've already, I, to be very honest, I made it pretty clear that I won't ask to continue okay. it because there was a, there was a, there was a method behind it. Mm -hmm. So the methodology is the reason I'm asking for the extension is simply because these guys aren't cleared yet. Okay. So yeah, do I think they'll ask maybe, but I kind of made it clear that this would be the end date for it. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Gary. Thank you. Uh, assigned counsel, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have uh, have my monthly report. Um, I don't have anything new to add to that. If there's any questions or concerns, did you ever come up with those numbers? We're, we're yeah, we're. I'm not done with the the report yet, but should have them to you. Yeah. It's the two grad students. Yeah. That you're talking about. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, just the, just two items, the, the last two, um, on January 17th and on the 27th, we were notified of those two grants that we applied for, um, year number five, uh, for the expansion of the Harrell Herring lawsuit. And uh, on the 27th, we got notified that uh, we would be reimbursed for additional attorney hours on some of these complex cases that, that that are coming in. Um, we got one last week. We got one the uh, week before that. So there's no lack of some of these complex, complex and complicated cases. Did you budget for this in anticipation? Yes. So it's not coming in as additional revenue? Or Correct. Unex okay. Mm -hmm. So good thing you got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on. All right, Andy. So just to be clear, all these that come in, I mean, ev so everybody is entitled to one of these lawyers? Uh, own. Everybody ex except a traffic violation. You get a, 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 a violation of the law, but if you're charged with a misdemeanor or a felony and you, uh, you fill out an assigned counsel application and we review that, um, income based, income based, but the presumption is that you're gonna you're gonna be eligible. So the presumption is you're gonna be eligible. So right. that means the income must be pretty high or something. No, the income is pretty low. But it's self self attestation. It is self, and, and, and so probably we reject out of ten. We reject maybe one or two. So probably eight, eight out of 10 get a site council that apply. And you probably really don't have any right to look into. Well, they really anti us in terms of you just what said. we can do and what we can't do. We used to ask for their, their bank accounts. We used to ask for their their, their pay stubs. We used to, uh, you, you know, if, if your child was under 18, we'd hold the parents responsible. Uh, and, and we can't do any of that anymore. Any other questions for Mr. Ashkin? Thank you. Next up is the coroner, Dr. Duckett. Um, 
I don't see him on the DB and I don't see him in the room. He has uh, no updates on his report. Next up would be the district attorney's office. We have Mr. Valdina tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we don't have a formal update. Uh, Brittany just um, asked me to convey her gratitude to the legislature for approving this new uh, grand jury furniture. Um, if anyone here or any other members of the legislature want to come up to look, uh, it's very, very nice compared to what we had before. And, um, and I think everyone knows that the health department also use our grand jury room from time to time so they get to enjoy that new furniture as well. Uh, just in terms of cases recently, I think most people are aware that uh, Brittany secured the conviction that uh, Shami Cope's murder trial uh, last month. And then we went to the day of trial on the bank robbery uh, from January of last year at the uh, Key Bank on West Jazz Street, C Street, the uh, main actor in that pled guilty and we got the maximum sentence. So that, that was certainly good. Unless they have any questions, that's uh, where we are. Very good. Any questions for the district attorney's office? Just one. Oh, yeah, you continue to stay fully staffed. Yes, we are still fully staffed. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Uh, next up would be uh, Fire EMO, Mr. Riley Shirt. Propaganda. Yeah, yes, and now propaganda. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you have my report in front of you. I do have four resolutions before you this evening. I first brought these up several months ago, stepping into the office. Um, I'm happy to explain further on any of them. They are all for accepting the grant funding. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. With your permission, I would bundle JP3 through 6 as they are all accepting grant funding. I have a motion. I would second that. And I have a second. Any discussion on bundling JP through through JP6? Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carry. All right. Very appreciative of that. Thank you. Um, moving on into the bulk of the report, I first want to ask if there are any questions about the report for the exception of the Public Safety Training Center. I'd like to take some time to just explain the status of the project on that a little bit further in depth. But before that, are there any questions on the remainder of the report? All right, hearing none. So this was passed out ahead of the meeting tonight. Um, this is an idea of our final selected site plan for the Public Safety Training Center, also known as the Fire Tower. Um, I believe Amanda might be able to put that up on the first and send it to her as well. There you have it. Um, just a brief history on what's led us into this point, um, starting with the site analysis by Bergman and Associates revealing that there were no ground contamination issues. We move forward with talking about the program plans and looking at what was needed at the facility in terms of a new classroom, vehicle storage, and site upgrades. Bergman turned around and presented us with five separate plans, all with variations to, <coughs> excuse me, both the classroom and the site itself. Um, I want to give a lot of credit to my deputy director, Harry Sherman, but also state fire instructors, Joe Chernesky, Travis Poole, and Jason Green. We all met and looked at all of the site and classroom options. Of the site and classroom options, we came up with one classroom that was truly our ideal classroom, and then we made some edits to it off of the Bergman plan. An example being they had four showers in a separate area versus having just two showers that are combined plumbing with toilet facilities. Um, we also looked at different site plans that included vehicle storage option, parking, um, movement of the existing confined, store, confined space trainer, and also where we would be looking at putting uh, backup power supply. And that led us into our next selection or next round, which was 1A, B, and C. 1A, we made some modifi modifications to later, which led us to 1A.2. Um, <clears throat> what you can see in front of you is 1A.2 is really the best of both worlds for both the site and the classroom facility. In any of the conversations that we've had about the existing classroom, 
it's a dirty classroom. It cannot be used for classroom training anymore. It can be used for live fire or not live fire, but live action training events. So we can use it for props. We can use it for anything involving bunker gear, but the very purpose is we have to have a separate facility for classroom training where students are not bringing bunker gear, where students are not bringing anything that's been exposed to live fire and we have some separation. Um, just some quick highlights on this design. This allowed us to accomplish that. Um, one of the concepts that Bergman gave to us included an accordion wall. There is no separation for carcinogens at that point in time. That does not meet the overall goal. This one does. So it takes the existing facility, puts in showers, walls off an SCBA fill station. We currently have a compressor at that site and now would be cutting down on noise pollution so we could fill bottles throughout a training well, not having to shout over the noise of that. This area would be blocked off and would be open for props, uh, confined space, uh, mass confidence, a number of <coughs> other evolutions, and it includes the installation of a mezzanine. Mezzanine would be allowing us the ability to do year-round indoors bailout training. Bailout training is something that's been state mandated for a number of years now. This allows us the ability to do it 365. Going down further, we have an expansion onto a kitchen area. We currently have no kitchen area at the classroom. Um, the kitchen area is an old TV cart with some microwaves and a coffee pot on top of it. This would allow that the IFO boot camp, I have a hard time not saying firefighter one, the IFO boot camp that occurs in the summer to have facilities for students to actually eat their lunch, store their lunch, et cetera. We break down further into a full-size classroom and then some just minor edits there. We are looking at putting an accordion wall in the breakout space to allow for independent testing sites. Um, so that's highlights on the classroom. Are there any questions on the classroom? I just want to bring up that the current classroom was uh, deemed not usable by the state and, and we were forced to shut it down. That's really <laughs> the reason that we came to this point. In 2016, it deemed it unusable, which is why our current BFO, which is basic exterior class, is being taught at a Wasco Fire Department and then they're coming over and doing the skill stations at the tower on other days. Are we still using the building off to the right of what the, where the fire tower was? Only for limited skills and limited and storage. We used to have meetings in there. Yeah, nine yep. <clears throat> and we're not supposed to anymore because it's a dirty classroom facility. We haven't used this since 16. We've used it just as they just a limited condemned. skills basis. When did the state come in and say you can't Roughly use it? Roughly 2016. Wow. You cannot do a classroom taught course in that building anymore, which really hampers your ability sure. because now you're putting the strain on Sata, Owasco, or really a central area fire departments to host a class. And then you're expecting your students to come in in the morning, break at lunch. Okay, guys, in an hour, we're all going to meet over at the tower. And you just get into a, an awful lot of hassle versus having one central facility training. And so that's why this is <coughs> modeling and reusing that section solely for the skills that we have been doing there all along, but then putting an entirely new classroom itself that allows us to go back to a central facility. Any further questions related to the classroom? Expanding upon it with the site, um, we are looking at putting in uh, additional parking. Uh, this would also involve paving of the area for the first time. It's been oil and stone for years. And then a vehicle storage facility over to the side. I know this has been a point of contention where we have approximately 16 trailers scattered throughout the county, some in Moravia, some in Owasco and the bulk of them all live at the tower. They're all, all of the ones at the tower are outside and are exposed to the elements year round. Whether it's bearings, whether it's tires, whether it's hitches, <coughs> we're investing consistently in buying trailers and purposing them for mass casualty incidents, swift water incidents, a, a barrage of types. And then we let them sit outside and get exposed to the elements. Um, this presents an ability to have a separate vehicle storage facility 
we would move our storage cage from the existing building over into the new one for response equipment, allowing a maximum use of classroom facilities and vehicle storage in this separate building. We're designing it in a way where access wouldn't be hampered if there was a class ongoing, um, including installation of a secondary hydrant branch line off of the existing one. So that way, if an incident was happening while well, the training was happening, we weren't, but we wouldn't be interfering, nor would the class be interfering with response capabilities. And that's a brief summary of the site plan. Are there any questions? This is what you guys have agreed. I mean, the, your team. The team has said this makes the most sense. This is the best of the worlds that were given to us by Bertman. They had some designs that were just out in left field that would have worked, mm -hmm. would have worked much better for perhaps like a hazmat training facility mm -hmm. that's dedicated to hazmat purposes. But we don't need six separate showers in a separate wing of a building. That's not what we're aiming for here. This was the best classroom that we could come up with. At the, and we also made modifications to use existing walls versus let's move a wall two feet to the south and cause a cause a jut or a corner that's only going to create additional cost as well. Um, so this is where to sum up tonight. Um, we've come up with this. We've talked with uh, the chairman. We've talked with the operations officer as well as the budget director. I've had multiple conversations with Mr. Strong about this as well. Um, we're looking for the next step to move from JPS and hopefully a full pres full scale presentation at full ledge later this month. And I'll, I'll leave the, the direction to, to Mr. Strong and this did, body. Did, did they give a cost for this? We're approximately 1.7 million. million is what we're looking at. Um, our rough estimates were all based and provided on what Bergman offered to us at industry cost. Um, <clears throat> there is some room for wiggle room, but you're really looking at over a quarter million dollars on the vehicle storage building. You're looking at paving of the area, the shell and the infrastructure of the new classroom. Some of this grant that you approved tonight towards the OC functions are going to allow for technology installation. So we're not going to be pulling all of this out of pocket, but we are looking at some balance. Any other questions for Riley on this brief presentation? Brian and I will discuss it later after the meeting, but we'll bring this forward. Um, at the a bigger presentation at uh, uh, the ledge for full full uh, ledge approval. Right, are you looking at an opera ask? Is that sort of I don't thinking? have or where I'm, I'm not privileged as to where the chairman and the budget director and everybody discussed that. I have no knowledge of that at the moment. That can be presented, that will be presented in ways. How's it, how it will be funded? It we okay. Sorry, no, no, that's right. Which is tomorrow night. So, if you're going to be away, so we'll hear this again. So Tim? Yes, Chair, thank you. So uh, Riley shared with me all the different plans and we spent a little bit of time talking about it and stuff. So, you know, this has been something that I heard about long before I became a legislator, probably eight years. At this, this, this project was first approached in 2007 for a vehicle storage building and then again in the, 16. Yeah, yeah. The whole facility, okay. you know, hearing from the local fire department, the volunteer fire departments and having to travel out of the county for training and so forth. So I know that I'll be in support of uh, doing something with this to get this facility back in shape and then it's a matter of maintaining it. Absolutely. Any other questions for Riley on this? Thank you, Riley. You got anything else for the group? That is it. All right, sir. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Riley. Next up would be probation, Mr. J.D. West Belair. Good evening, everybody. Um, for my report, uh, only one minor addition to that under the alternatives to incarceration bullet point. The uh, plan application that I referred to was actually re uh, received today. <coughs> so they're, they're well ahead of time on that. Um, the ATI board will start taking a look at that and working with uh, the chair and budget director, social services, community, co community counseling, 
um, share that as we go forward. Probably will start looking at that within the next couple of weeks. Uh, three resolutions on this evening, unless anyone has any questions about anything else in my report. Um, I'm gonna skip right to the last one for a second, uh, JP9 which was uh, seeking authorization to move funds from contingency to the department's auto expense account. Fortunately, the repairs to one of our department vehicles came in significantly below expectations. Um, so I'm willing to withdraw that, resol that uh, resolution. We don't need to make that transfer at this point in time. Uh, we only spent $801 as opposed to the 4,100 we were anticipating. So there's really no need to make any transfer of funds at this point in time. So you want to go ahead and just able or We just won't pull it, pull it, right? pull, it. Pull, it. Pull, it. pull it. Just pull it, pull it. Just pull it. okay. Uh, we'll just make it for a note that uh, JP9 was pulled at the request of uh, the director. Thank you very much. That makes that one nice and simple. Uh, JP7 um, is kind of, the, 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 the two remaining resolutions are kind of cleaning up some hangover business from last year. Uh, so I did previously uh, request authorization to enter into a contract with national test systems. Um, not really sure where that got sidetracked last year. This will allow the department to contract with a provider to allow us to purchase drug testing supplies, <clears throat> get training and support through national test services, and also for the first time to have a contract to allow us to get urine screen samples lab tested uh, to verify uh, levels and uh, you know substances that are found in the sample. I have a motion for JP7. Second. I have a second. Uh, any discussion? I have discussion. Yes, sir. So, that is, so you get an immediate result? Meaning positive or negative? Well, these would be the dip test. Yeah, so it's dip test. So this is a follow up, it, like if they sign the admission or something. Right, right. And up till now, um, we've never really had most of our screening supplies. We beg and borrow from from drug court. Oh, okay. We don't have it budgeted out of our own resources. We we make some small purchases here and there. This will allow us for the first time to have a really completely filled out testing program. Right. We'll get the officers tested through these people. They provide us regular routine updates on trends in use and chemical compositions, you know, all the different stuff that hits the streets that we're usually behind. It's just a really good program. Good, good, definitely. Um, the, just one follow up, if yes, I could. Uh, so because you mentioned that we because i remember we did talk about this so it is budgeted for the money is in your account yep so very minor good. equipment and it's you know be on an as needed basis you know we're not going to need you know tens of thousands of dollars but it just allows us to control our own program the other uh questions yes go ahead. they have a price that you'd pay for these particular pieces of equipment and you do your own internal testing yeah they're one use dip tests they're anywhere depending on the substances we want to test, they can be a single substance. Yeah. Like usually we still have some single test marijuana yeah. tests um, up to like a 12 panel test. And of course the price varies widely. Yeah, You'll buy the supplies you need to Correct. do the internal testing. Yep, And it'll be supplementing what we continue to receive from drug court, but it just, it also provides us a little more flexibility. But it also allows you that lab testing, right? Correct. If, if they've never been able to do, it'll be nice to have that. I think. That's a great ability to know the levels, how much use, yeah, you know, and verify it right on the spot. No, I don't think. Well, well the lab that. test won't be that. Would the sample would have to be set out? But here's the thing: legalistically, the results of the dip test aren't admissible in court. New York State does not allow that as admissible evidence. This the laboratory test result is admissible. The dip is the screening that you'll use to send the lab Correct. out. Correct. Yeah, that's the step. That's the first step. But the beautiful thing is getting the lab result back is yep. an automatic verification. <clears throat> it is automatically admissible, whether they admit to it or not. Any other questions? Heidi? Um, Jay, will the, the information that you get back from the lab test about the kinds of substances that are currently we're finding in the community, is there a way to share that legally 
with um, like healing communities as they continue to be research oriented and looking at what's on the street and really happening seems actually you're sort of you're sort of gathering data. Yes, our caseload explorer system when when the officers test a, an individual, um, we enter it into our internal caseload management system and I can do a, a pull out of all of that data that that's something that there's no names or anything attached to it. I could do that in a completely blind way and that yes, that could be shared. I would suggest, yeah, even you know, bringing that up now with the healing communities uh, committee. That once we do pass this, if it passes, that you know, there's a there's you know, a spotlight on what's out there. Right? Yeah, that would that's that would that's a very good point. I'd be happy to share. That. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none. All in favor? All right. Any opposed? Harry, uh, JP eight. All right. Um, we're back where we started from. Um, so JP8 is seeking to authorize the probation department to fill a part-time clerk position. Um, this position will be for the purpose of the ignition interlock conditional discharge monitor. Um, it's going to be separated out from the STOP DWI program. Um, it's budgeted. It's really kind of reactivating a position that is part of the probation department's staff list, uh, but has been vacant for a number of years. Uh, can I get a motion? I'll second. A motion. I have a second. This is the sixteen thousand dollars that we've been talking about for a million months yep. that got transferred over since last June, by my count. Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, John Madden. He was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, they, the money did go into your budget. Correct. Now you're going to use it to offset. It's, it, it will pay the salary for this part-time position. Any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carrie? Thank you all very much. Anybody Thank else? You, okay. Thank you, Jake. Next up, Sharon. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Sure. My report, I've got a couple of items related to my report that I just wanted mm -hmm. to speak to tonight. If I could. Uh, the first item, the number of individuals we have in our jail, our count remains pretty high right now. Um, and I, I put that on our report each month just to keep you abreast of where we're at with board and revenue. Um, we've had to turn a few potential board ends away just because of where our count's at. I'm always hopeful that our local population is going to drop, but our count remains high right now. And when you uh, saw Mr. Hoskins' report, you see that we're arraigning quite a few individuals monthly still we continue to and we're just seeing a, an influx of uh, local arrests and local charges that are keeping our count high so um, we try to you know to, to maintain our board and revenue our budgeted revenue for the year we really want to get that federal board and number up closer to 30 uh, fed so hopefully you know our numbers drop and we can increase that number later in the year to get that average up but I just want to keep you up to date with that um, the second item um, on the 25th of January, the State Commission of Corrections sent me a letter um, with, a, with some concern about our ability to provide mental health resources in the jail. As everybody knows, we work with uh, <coughs> mental health to provide those resources in our facility. Uh, we've had some difficulties apparently meeting that need. After getting that letter, I did meet with our mental health director. I met Gloria Walsh. Uh, we also met with our social worker that's full-time in the jail that's uh, embedded there. Uh, she's having a very difficult time right now meeting the need for a number of reasons. One, our count remains high and it's been very steady for a long time. And number two, um, I think everybody is aware that we, we've got a lot of mental health challenges within our community that are obviously, um, you know, impacting us within the jail. So we're going to have to look at some solutions uh, short term. We're going to have to look at some solutions long term. If, it, if we don't see our count drop, if we don't see the mental health of our inmate population change, uh, we're going to have to work on something for the long term. So um, I would like to see, you know, maybe in the short term, uh, you know, we contract with somebody to provide some additional resources. Um, you know, maybe somebody that already works for the county could come out and provide some additional support. I know Lauren's researching that to see if we have some options, but I have to report back to the commission within 30 days from the date of that letter. So by the 25th of February, what our short term solution is going to be and what some of our long-term goals will be. So 
Um, this isn't great news, um, you know, it's something that continues and I'm very concerned that it is, will continue that we're gonna have to come back, you know, looking for some funding that, that's not in our budget <coughs> to try to address that need. Can I ask a question? Sure. If these are individuals, all people are screened for mental health issues on admission or just if they have a history or if they request they're in crisis. I mean, how, what's your obligation? Actually all of the above. So okay. we're, we're mandated to provide the same standard of care within the facility that people are entitled to outside of the facility. So if everybody's screened when they come in, mm -hmm. if somebody uh, requests to see mental health, we're obligated to see them. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly if somebody's in crisis, we're ob obligated to see them. Um, if somebody's in crisis, uh, you know, for example, if there's suicide risk, we're going to be seen more often. Um, and we've got a number of very difficult cases because, you know, the state, the state has really put the burden of mental health on a lot of uh, sheriffs across the state. We've got people that are in our jail who committed crimes that are there that, in my opinion, really shouldn't be under our care. They should be in a mental health facility. Mm -hmm. but there's really nowhere else for them to go. And the issue is the timeliness of that evaluation, too. I mean, if, if it takes a week and something awful happens, is that? Well, and that's, that's the bigger issue, a liability issue. Yeah. If something happens and we're not meeting that need, it can set us up for a great deal of liability. So we don't want that to happen. I got a couple of questions here, uh, Andy and then Heidi. Yeah, kind of a two part on one, how, I mean, how does the state know this and what, what are they going to, I mean, if they determine that, you know, you haven't met the need that we expect you to meet, what do they do? You're wondering how they found out or how they, well, yeah, I mean, how they found out and what are they going to do? Take the <clears throat> prisoners and put them somewhere else or what's, I, I'm confused on that part. So every, uh, every inmate at the jail has the ability to put a file of grievance if they're not happy with the services they receive. You know, whether it's a health related issue, mental health related issue, they can file a grievance. Um, we answer the grievous grievance. If they're not satisfied with our answer, they forward that to the state. We're obligated to send that to the state commission of corrections. They review the grievance and then they decide whether or not they're going to take the grievance and look into it further. Uh, they've received a number of grievances from our population due to the fact that we haven't been able to meet the need. And quite a few of those have been due to the fact that we haven't been able to get to the individual in a timely manner. So that's what prompted the commission to say, you need to look at fixing that and doing something different. The commission writes a letter, obviously, they tell me that we need to do something different. You need to tell us how you're gonna address this. If we don't do that, they can certainly come in. They can tell us what we're gonna do. They can, they can do a staffing analysis on our medical facility and say, you know, we're gonna require you to have X number of individuals that are addressing this need, you know, and, and if you don't, they can take action against us to force us to do that. Um, so I would rather that we come up with a solution rather than having the state tell us how many positions we have to have at the jail, because I'm hoping that we can provide a short-term solution that doesn't have a long-term monetary impact. Because if they come in and say, your minimum staffing analysis for your medical division is this many individuals, then we're going to be stuck with that many individuals. And I, I, wanted, I would rather make the solution um, and put that on paper with Lauren rather than have them do it. I, um, I think as you work through the solutions and the corrective action that you have to report back, that if we um, are presented with the, the need to um, pay for per diem or however you may uh, decide around social workers coming in within your consultation with, with Lauren, um, that we may have upfront costs, but if we provide good mental health and then follow-up services, case management, all of that, that I understand is sort of part of the new program. Um, you know, long-term, the, the goal would be to see declining arrests. We, we would hope, I mean, there's, there's such a need, it's very concerning. You know, it's, it's hard to meet the need in our community. There's not enough staff out there, therapists and, and people to, uh, to meet that need. So this is going to be very challenging, um, but we're going to have to come up with some type of short-term solution. And, and again, I'm going to lean on Lauren for that because she's, you know, she's the expert when it comes to mental health. Chris, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hey, Sheriff, good to see you. Glad you're doing well. Thank you. Um, you guys have a reentry program, right? We do. That reentry program has a grant and a therapist attached to it, right? 
They do. So we do have the reentry program. There are specific individuals that are in that program. So they do receive some additional therapy through Pew Counseling Services. That's in place now, but that's just a select group of inmates uh, that are seen by this therapist. She has a full caseload there. So um, she wouldn't be able to see people beyond this program that's funded by the grant. So this need is above and beyond um, what is provided. But if we didn't have that, we would be even in a worse situation. So there, you know, the, the need is is just beyond what I've ever seen, you know, since I've been with the sheriff's office. And I think everybody can respect that with what we're seeing in our community. Outside of the Cuba Counseling Select program, the current mental health needs of the population are all met by Cuba County Mental Health. Correct. We have, you have a case, a staff social worker that is part of the mental health operation that's assigned there. And that would likely be the recommendation versus going outside or who knows I, I, whether she has capacity to do that is really going to be the question. Yeah, that's really going to be up to, to Lauren. Yes. But yes, to answer your question, we do have one full time social worker embedded from mental health. She really doesn't have the time right now to provide any therapy, therapeutic services. Mm -hmm. She's really just, you know, kind of triage and everything, um, you know, and moving on to the next person without providing that, that therapy that really is needed in the facility. Mr. Petrus. Um, Sheriff, I, um, I would encourage you to revisit um, the local providers and see if they have the capacity to um, take up that slack. Yeah, that, I'm hopeful that we can contract to provide that care. I think I would much rather do that and see us look to add a position that we, we may not want to see funded for a long period of time and then give us the opportunity to see where this goes. I mean, if this goes on for a course of years, we may have to, to do something different, but regardless, we're going to have to do that. Do you have any questions? Mark, here, before we get into resolutions. Mark, I got one. Oh, sir. Go ahead. But how's your staffing? How's the, the jail on the road? So actually some good news there. Uh, we're down 11 positions in the jail still. However, we just uh, we just hired four custody officers to start an academy on the 24th of February. And we have two more that look very positive that we're gonna bring in behind them. So there's six staff members and uh, that's before we get into the list for the new pilot program that state civil service allowed us to, to uh, do with, with uh, the custody division. So we've got some, uh, some hires and it looks very promising for, you know it's been a lot of time coming and we're down three people on the road well, actually uh, resolution, one of the resolutions addresses that tonight but so we've got a couple of promising individuals uh, to bring on the road patrol division for an academy that starts on march 20th so i think i think things are really looking up uh, with that i know 178 is an awful lot you get up to 180 and you're in trouble but they got to be working a lot of overtime, mandated overtime. They are uh, a lot of voluntary overtime, but there is mandato mandatory overtime as well. And, you know, that impacts morale. You can, people can't work like that forever. And I uh, really want to get our numbers back up there. It's been hard. We've been trying hard to recruit. Um, we've had very poor lists. We haven't had good quality candidates. But this last list from our last test that we gave is, uh, I think we've got six solid candidates uh, that looks like we're going to be able to to bring on, which is going to have a huge impact once they get out of the academy. Great. Thank you very much. Outstanding. Very good. Dan, yeah, Heidi? What is the um, the age requirement for entering um, employment as a custody is 21 and I think the road's 20. I know they're off by a year. I think that can be adjusted. Um, I see some counties, or, I don't know if it's county or state, are offering uh, jobs for custody uh, officers at age 19. Hey. I think that can be a Adjusted. They're trying it. They're trying it. Yeah. They're inside and outside, separating what uh, peace officers, not peace officers. Yeah. It's, they have to be 21 to be a peace officer. Yeah. So I think there's some flexibility there, but if, um, I don't know that that would really help us with our recruiting challenges from what I've seen. Any other questions for the sheriff before we get into resolutions? Okay, sir. All right, ahead and start with uh, GP10. Sure. So JP10 is our yearly resolution to fill our Marine staff, uh, to hire our part-time staff for the Marine Patrol Division. Move it up. Second. Got a motion to second. Uh, any discussion? 
I thought he was done. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Look at the back sheet. You're making, you're making that easy for me. He got to the end of the sentence that was on the sheet. <laughs> look at the JP 11. Uh, JP 11 is a resolution to fill two budgeted uh, vacant deputy sheriff positions. Move it. Thank you. I'll take him. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? All right. Any opposed? Jerry, JP12. JP12 is for the purchase of the seven uh, marked patrol cars that were budgeted. Move it. I have a motion. Second. And I have a second. Any discussion? I got one. Okay, sir. If we're going to finally have somebody, because we've, as Brian knows, we've gone around and around on this. We shouldn't have high mileage vehicles, especially in the sheriff's department. We're going to get more for them by getting rid of them after, you know, a certain amount of time or miles or something. Make money. So, or get some money. yeah, actually get something out of them. So let's hope if we're doing this with the highway department as far as a motor pool and actually having somebody keep track of this stuff, because this, you know, this needs to be kept track of. Just the same as the car that gets 3,000 miles a year and has the brakes rust out because we shouldn't even have a car that only drives 3,000 miles a year. I think so. there's a supply chain issue, Brian, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, we've had some challenges. We were just getting three cars and now to be equipped that we ordered last year. So it's been about a year to get these three. I'm very concerned and hopeful. That we can order these seven. The uh, the window to order them isn't open right now. Ford's not taking uh, orders year round. They just open a, a short window for law enforcement agencies to get their order in. So I'm hoping that that window comes uh, available to us in March. But if we order them in March and uh, we don't get those in less than a year, we're going to be struggling a little bit with the mileage we have on, on some of these vehicles. But I'm hopeful that what is the happens. mileage on some of them? So I did write. I wondered if you might ask, so I did write down some information here, but I, I didn't have an updated sheet, but as of December of 2021, just to give you an idea, that first car, the 2017 Ford, had 110,000, um, and the other two 2017s were right in the area of 100,000, and then the 20, all of the 2019s ranged from 70,000 to 83,000. That was December of 21, so you can tack on about 20,000 miles on each of those cars, um, to get, give you an idea where they're at. So some of them are up in the 130, 130,000 mile range. And those are hard miles responding to calls out in the county. So they're, they're getting up there. By the end of this year, a, some, a, there's a, good, a couple of those cars we're probably going to have to take out of service by the end of the year. So whether we can replace them or not. Is this the end of all the leases? It, the end of this year will be. Okay. With these seven purchases or there's more cars that have to get out of lease and be purchased so all of the leases will be up by the end of this year but we get to keep the cars okay because it was an equity lease yep. so we're going to have the cars we'll, we'll be done with the leases okay. all the leases by you'll, the end of this you'll year you'll own them all by the end of the year we will but unfortunately with the mileage i'm going to have to come back to you next year for the same number looking for the same number of cars that we're, we're purchasing this year my hope is that we can get back on a rotation where i'd like to see us you know, purchasing five or six cars a year, continually rolling and not looking for a large number of, of cars all at once. Um, we're going to, we're going to limp a few cars this year. I, you know, I, I had considered asking you for 10 cars this year, but I didn't want to put that kind of strain on the additional strain on the budget. So I only asked for seven, but my hope is to lower that number each year. Any other discussion on GP12? If not, here. Oh, yep. So do they, do these, the cars that are being taken out of service, they get rolled back to the dealer or how? If we'll they sell the leases or? They we'll sell those via auction and then that oh, money okay. will go back to the clerk. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. GP uh, 13. Uh, JT13 or JP13 <laughs> is a uh, resolution to replace an undercover vehicle utilizing some drug seizure funding. I have a motion. Thank you, second. Second. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carry. JP 14 is to extend the agreement with LexisNexis. They provide the law library services to our jail via key kiosks and uh, iPads. Uh, so this is uh, a service that we've had for quite some time. We're just looking to renew that. Move it for discussion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Peters. Oh, Sorry. Andy Burton. No, 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 no. I mean, is this is this man? Does the state mandate this? They do. I know you to get to that. Yeah. So we we have a couple options. Either we could do this electronically with the kiosks and the iPads, or we could have a a law library with books, and we'd have to purchase all these books each year and bring the inmates to the library to let them do the research. It'd be a lot more cumbersome and take a lot more time. So doing it electronically is easier. And I'm assuming the state kicks nothing in towards it. No. We're responsible to provide this. And Chris, no, thanks, Andy. Andy took care of Andy articulating care of my uh, uh, Heidi, Can we give Heidi, some of Chris's? That we one? have 23 terminals. And is that um, based on a percentage that's required, you know, per number <laughs> in the one can contain at the at the facility, or we, is it just randomly we have 23 there? We just have to provide uh, access in each one of the areas within the jail. So that just that covers each area in the jail where in, different inmates can have access to it. Do you find the inmates using them? They do. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they sure do. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion on JP14? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Gary. <laughs> JP 15 is I'm seeking an increase to the part time salary of the jail physician. Uh, that there is money in my part time salary budget in the jail uh, to give him uh, increased salary for the increased workload that he's doing as a result of the MAT program, the medication assisted treatment, and uh, the duties that he has to do at the jail. Got a motion? Do second for discussion? I have a second. Uh, and discussion, Heidi, go ahead. Um, I just wondered what the percentage increase in his salary is. That would be a 15% increase, approximately. I can tell you, um, I'll just give you some insight into what Dr. Duckett does, but I really don't want to see us lose Dr. Duckett. Um, he does an incredible amount of work for us at the jail. He's available every day. Um, on call and he answers multiple calls every single day of the year um, by our nursing staff because he's really providing supervision and oversight every day, um, not just with the MAT program, but you know, you, you see the number of inmates we have, the problems we're dealing with with mental health, we're dealing with equal number of problems with their physical health. People are coming in extremely uh, unhealthy uh, right now. We, we've got a mess, but Dr. Duckett is always available. He comes in a couple of days a week. Uh, to see inmates uh, after hours um, and with the MAT program that's really increased the amount of time that he has to spend <clears throat> working with the nurses uh, to prescribe these uh, medications and uh, monitor these folks that are, that are on them so um, if we had to replace him if we lost him I'm very certain that uh, it would be very difficult to replace him with and, and to get the amount of time uh, from somebody new that we get from them, especially the on-call availability, even when he's on vacation, when he's away, he's, he's coordinating on the telephone. So um, we we get a lot of uh, we get a lot of quality work from Dr. Duckett, uh, in my opinion, for what we pay for an actual medical doctor, and we are mandated by the state to have a have a physician oversee our medical division and provide this resource. Any other discussion? Go ahead, Paul. And when an inmate is released after maybe 60, 90, 180 days in, in custody and being treated by uh, Dr. Duckett, is there um, an exit program for them to be set up with a primary so it doesn't just drop off their, their, their medications and their medical issues just don't drop off the radar? There is, so we've got a, a few different paths. We've got our transition coordinator who's full-time that is lining up that transition plan for each inmate when they leave to try to make sure that they're 
they're set up with their appointments, that they have housing, that they have everything they need to make that transition. And that includes medical appointments and treatment for any mental health uh, issues or challenges they have, including, and as well as addiction. Uh, we also have our program of acute counseling um, that uh, is a separate program. Those inmates are specifically working with acute counseling for some of the same services. The difference with those inmates is when they're released, they continue to work with cubic counseling on those transition services once they're outside of our facility. Um, but that's, that's key. We don't want to help them while they're in the facility and do that work to get them to a good place and then lose them when they go to the door. So we do as much as we can to line them up and make sure that they're continuing uh, to have those services when, when they leave. And so you as our sheriff have a strong belief in those programs that fills follow-up programs and as you said, setting them out in a good place and then having the referrals to the counseling or wherever it may be in place and um, continuing for them. You even mentioned housing, so it's sort of full service. I absolutely do. I mean, they're a captive audience when they're with us, right? They're safe, mm -hmm. they're not using drugs, they're getting the help that they need. We do this work to help them. I have seen many successes come out of our jail. One of the challenges we have right now is when they're leaving, we don't have we don't have good housing for, for our homeless population. So if an inmate leaves, they don't have a, a, a place to go. We're plugging them into a motel or some somewhere local that's drug infested. And we're doing all this work to help them. And we're, we're going, we're spiraling, spiraling right back into a bad place. So there are some challenges, but we're also having some successes with our transition programs, getting people into, you know, rehabilitation, uh, getting them jobs before they, they leave. We've had some success with that. So um, we have the ability to help more people, I think, but, um, you know, it's a challenge with the resources that we have and with both within and, and outside the facility. And I just want to um, sort of say that I asked those questions so that we can all hear this and hear this from you, who's the expert, um, regardless of what our opinions are about, um, you know, mental health and addiction um, services that, that as an expert you're seeing you're seeing success yeah one thing that's very rewarding to me and i think all of you have seen it but uh, next ride for friends we've had some individuals who've been incarcerated in our facility um they've had some help they've gotten out they've become peers for next ride for friends helped others and i i want to see that cycle continue and we can do more and more with that but we are seeing some some success um not nearly enough but um, that's the time to that's the time to help people. If they're ready, if they're ready to get help, that's the time to get them the, the, the help. Not everybody's ready, but you know, and not everybody in our facility can be helped. There's people there that are going to do their time. They're going to leave and they're they're going to do whatever and come back. But um, there are some that we can help. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Uh, last one, JP 16. The last one, the last one, JP 16, is just to extend our contract with Galls. We do prov provide uniforms to our staff members uh, utilizing Galls. Uh, they have an online platform that, that we purchase uh, the uniforms from. We do get, get a 15% discount um, by utilizing this service. And we're simply looking to piggyback off of the Albany County contract that the Albany County Sheriff has with them to do this. A lot of law enforcement agencies and sheriffs across the state um, take advantage of the same contract to, to utilize the same service and get the same pricing. So it gives us some additional buying power because so many agencies are, are uh, utilizing this contract and we're just looking to extend it. We've been with them since 2019. I'll move it. I have a motion. Second, I'll second it if don't second. Okay, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? All right. Any opposed? Terry, anybody have anything else for the chair? Thank you, sir. Oh, I do have one more thing. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I know it's been a long night. Uh, Legislator Basile and uh, Chairman Gould asked me if I would look into um, security here in the office building and what what it might cost or if we could even bring a magnetometer and um, some yeah, metal detector metal detector, oh, okay. metal detector and some equipment to scan bags uh, in our lobby and uh, the under sheriff and I under sheriff Peenster and I we actually took a field trip over to the Seneca County office building because they do have 
that set up over there and they're currently doing that. They don't issue IDs. They don't issue stickers and, and IDs, but they actually have the, the metal detector and the scanner there. Um, so we, we, we went over there and we kind of watched how long it takes for people to, to be buzzed through that. It doesn't take long at all. And we actually have um, plenty of room in our lobby to, to set up exactly as they have over there. And it's my opinion <laughs> that I think we're much safer if we if we're scanning people through those, making sure they don't have weapons on them when they come in and just issuing a sticker and a tag and not knowing what somebody's carrying. So um, I was asked if I would look into that. I brought some pricing just to give you a general idea of what it would cost for the equipment uh, to have the uh, magnetometer, the metal detector that, that individuals walk through. That's approximately $4,000. And the scanner for bags, for purses or whatever, we would have to run through uh, that scanner, that would be about $25,000. Uh, so you'd be looking probably by the time we've got some of the tables and other smaller items that we would need, like baskets and some of the equipment, probably looking somewhere in the range of like thirty to 35000 for the equipment. Um, but I bring that to you because I was asked uh, for, for us to look into that, and that's where we're at. So I got uh, hands everywhere. So I'll start with Chris. Uh, Sheriff, those machines have to be calibrated, right? I don't know the answer to they, that. They Ours do. do. I, yeah, I believe okay. they do. And the, so that, that's a, a factor to take into consideration. Okay. Um, because that's you know kind of like the software maintenance it's going to be a sort of a hidden cost in there and then your your deputies are going to have to be trained i know they know how to do it but for legal purposes they're going to have to be trained on it so these things will further complicate that sure i just got the quotes today i, I um we visited last friday we had some difficulty getting over there but i just got the quotes for similar equipment today so it sounds like there may be some additional things that we need to look at, but we do utilize those over at the courthouse across the street without any issue. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm coming to you today to let you know that I, I, I see that we could do that here with our setup. And if the office building is upgraded or, you know, we, however, you know, that, that goes, if we were to build a new building or upgrade it, the equipment could certainly be, you know, transferred if we decide to go that route. And just a follow up question. So, I guess it's just to make sure I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly. <clears throat> we could accomplish security by just setting up the no-go zones, the not for public access, and giving assigning a pass. If they won't agree to it. We can give them the, an ask. They're the proud owner of an escort at that point. Or, in your opinion, even though it's might take an investment, it would be more beneficial for public safety to screen people through a magnetometer and their bags through a um, scanner. It's my opinion that we would be much safer to scan everybody that comes into the building through the front door. And really, I rather than knowing who they are and not knowing what they're carrying, I'd rather scan everybody and know that they don't have any weapons on them. And, you know, we don't have to be concerned with what they're bringing into the building. I have. Bob, you're first, and then sheriff. How many? How many were on staff when you went over there? Your visit. There was one full-time deputy sheriff. They actually don't have special patrol officers over there in the office building. They had one full-time deputy sheriff uh, who was there about half the time that that I was there, and then a part-time deputy sheriff came a little bit later. So they have less traffic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Seneca County is a smaller county, mm -hmm. um, but this that would easily be accomplished with you know three part-time. <laughs> the the one full-time. Uh, Patrol deputy was, you know, he was just running people through as, as they were coming with no issues. So one of the things that he uh, he told us was, you know, so many people in your community get used to that that it just kind of it kind of flows on its own after you know everybody figures that figures it out. They're not walking in with things because they know that they're going to have to go through a magnetometer. Mm -hmm. So most people are coming in, their bags are going through, and they're walking through with no issue because they've been through it before and they know the drill. Yeah. I would imagine, you know, <laughs> they do this and, and initially there'd be a learning curve for not just our staff, but for the public. But um, I see no problem with us doing that here. And I, I really do believe that we would be safer if we were doing that. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, so I, I think <laughs> what legislator teachers meant to say was our employee safety too when he mentioned public safety ah uh, sure uh, i kind of lumped them in there i but. think i think maybe 
um, and and so this all generated just so you have a little bit. This all generated from a visit I made to the county building a month ago, and I was getting on and I was here during the day, which is uh, not normal for me. And uh, people were getting on and off the elevator, different floors, and I was saying that I had my bat they had badges on. I didn't know if they were visitors, they were employees. Uh, and then I stopped to talk to a few people and they were talking about an incident where someone came in with a knife uh, that, you know, they just came in, checked in. There was no question with their name. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we've seen some emails about, you know, not letting people in the back door if they don't have a badge. You know, I think for our employees, it's, it's important and for the general public until at some point we have a system that only allows people to access certain floors. We have, uh, you know, some of our, our health services in this building. So, um, and security needs to be a big part of the, uh, the planning, the, the new planning for the new building. Or I think it's an initiative now, that, uh, I, I've asked the sheriff to look into and, and, uh, the chair, Mr. Gould has been, uh, promoting it through emails and stuff <laughs> ways to step their game up. So, um, I'd like to, Consider it and how we fund it is another discussion. But I absolutely agree with the sheriff and Jim, and hopefully everybody here. It is the safest way in the world to do this. Our, our employees deserve this. Everybody deserves this. We can do it, and, and we can do it. So I'm asking for your support for this. Where we'll get the money, That's we'll talk about that later, but it's not that much money. We need to do something. We had an incident just last week, another one. So we need to do something to protect everybody here. And that's the best way to do it. So Sheriff, whatever you need from me, you got. Well, I'm, I'm happy to dive a little deeper into the reoccurring costs. If there's going to be calibration or yearly service fees with the equipment. Yes. I can dive deeper into that and bring that back. Um, whatever, whatever you want me to do. I just want to be clear. I don't think that should prohibit us from going down this road. No, but I think that's a good point that, you know, we're, we're just getting into finding out what the cost of the equipment is. And we should know about calibration and training and, and stuff. Yeah. But I can tell you, we can absolutely do it with the footprint here. We have plenty of room in our lobby. We can do this. This is a little off topic, but um, associated with, with um, safety. I was here a couple of months ago and I went to the third floor, which is pretty, you know, there's, there's tough business that goes on there. And so when I exited, I was in the elevator with a man who was clearly absolutely um, uh, drunk, like out of his mind. And uh, I felt very unsafe in the elevator with him. And he was, you know, kind of waving all over the place, talking crazily to me, uh, you know, and also, and I had watched him work with the staff behind the glass window. Um, and, and, you know, they, they had a very difficult time with him because of course, at that state of alcohol use, he what he wasn't able to make sense of, of anything he needed to respond to. Is there, I mean, is there a way that your deputies, when they because this was clear, but they notice that kind of alcohol, if they have could they have a breathalyzer available and not allow entry for the safety of our the folks who are going to have to deal with them while they're here. Yeah, I mean, not just due to the fact that there's alcohol on their breath. I mean, they if they're exhibiting some some sign that would make us think they're a security risk, sure. But I don't think just because just because there's alcohol on their breath. But I do know that right now, if, if somebody comes in and they're they're not acting right, you know, they can't. People can't be denied services. Right. But we can deny them access to the other floors. Um, there are times where where they will call DSS down to meet them on the first floor, and that might have been a situation where maybe they should have taken them aside. And called upstairs and said somebody needs to come down here and meet him. And you know, I, I I'm not familiar with the situation, so I can't really speak to it. But that's what's supposed to happen, and that does happen quite frequently. If somebody comes in and they clearly just shouldn't be walk wandering around the building, we're calling and having them come downstairs. But if an incident like that presents itself, oh, we should know about it. Certainly, let us know, and we'll you know try to do better in that situation next time. Um, last question, yes, sir. Or last uh, statement, I guess. When we uh, talk to you guys on the twenty eighth about the building project, uh, that that will be talked about. Our our future and our hope of the future 
Everybody stays on the first floor. There's not an employee. No one enters the second floor or above. They all stay on the first floor. We'll have rooms to interview, social services, whatever. Nobody goes past the first floor unless they're an employee here. That's the hope of the new building. Just so, and we'll talk about it. So I just wanted everybody to get that information out to everybody. Can you legally do that? The county has behavioral policies in place. Yeah. I know, but I'm just saying if it's not, I mean, that would be like saying the other five floors are all. They'll have access to ever what they need, Annie. It's just our people will come down to the first floor. And then take them up? No. Well, if they, if they deem fit, yeah, as long as they're with somebody. But if they they think that there are going to be a trouble, there'll be interview rooms to interview downstairs. Same way with the, with the clerk's office. That'll be on the first floor. Everything that's needed as far as interviewing uh, civilians, citizens, will be on the first floor. That's what we're hoping. I mean, it's going to be up to this group, but that's what we're hoping. That's part of the design. All right. Anything else for GPS? I'll entertain, entertain a motion. So moved. Great job, Brian. Thank you. Riley. Thanks. I'll later.